Um, next question is about the Vanguard Diversified High Growth ETF, VDHG, as it's commonly known, an ETF that I own. Kate, do you own this ETF? No, I don't. I, I have a diversified ETF portfolio, so I do it a bit more manually, I guess, than having the one ETF to rule them all. One ETF to rule them all sounds like a marketing pitch. Um, so I I'll just read love the... Lord of the Rings, but... <laughs> oh, okay, here we go. Um and, but it, this isn't a good way, right? The one ring to rule them all was a bad thing. Um, so here we go. Yeah, I guess this is the opposite of the, the situation. Of the rings. You, yes, just in case yeah. you don't know, that's a Lord of the Rings reference. So um, hi, Kate Nolan, or Owen and Kate. I'm 24 and new to investing. That's less than two months. And after listening to your podcast, I decided to invest in my first ETF in brackets VAS, which is the VAS ETF VAS from Vanguard for around 900 smackaroos. It seemed like a great entry level ETF with low fees. I have now saved up another thousand, which I'm going to use to buy another ETF. After doing some research over the time saving, I saw big surprise VDHD seemed like a good option for me. VDHD is already 35% invested in VAS. So this is for those who don't know v the VDHG ETF is a diversified ETF. So normally in an ETF, you would invest in the ETF and then that ETF would buy shares for you. The VDHG ETF actually buys other ETFs, which then buy the shares. So VDHG is 35% invested in VAS, which is invested in Australian shares. So I'm wondering if it is worth having both of these ETFs in my portfolio, or should I just choose one? I'm leaning towards VDHG, but I wouldn't want to sell what I have in VAS as I haven't held it for more than one year. To summarize, is it poor diversification to have multiple ETFs with this much crossover? Regards, Jack. So Jack, we can't answer your question to tell you what's right for your situation. I wanna just make that clear. We're not answering, you've given us a lot of info about your situation and your goals and all that sort of stuff, which is delightful. We love that in the Facebook community, but Kate and I can't answer this question with regard to what you should do. So we're gonna answer it just in general terms about what happens when you have ETFs that do the same thing, basically. And these hmm. diversified ETFs are introducing that, that question for a lot of people. So Kate, any ideas? Yeah, the first thing I want to say, it's fantastic that you're getting started early and actually doing the research. This is, this is what we preach. So it's fantastic to see. Hmm. The first thing that I would look at is actually going into VDHD and looking at, looking at the makeup of that um, ETF because it has a lot of things that you might not have normally put in a diversified portfolio. So VDHG actually has uh, just over a 6% exposure to a small company's uh, ETF. And so maybe not everyone would put that into a diversified portfolio. It really depends on your approach. So I think firstly, if you are interested in VDHG or any of those other ETFs, like beta shares have a few that are pre-mixed, mm. actually looking at what is, is what is it holding inside and does that suit your own risk profile and your investment strategy? Because maybe you don't want emerging markets or small companies or bonds or hedging. And VDHG has a bit of all of that. It's a definitely like a fruit salad going on there. Fruit um, salad, yes. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So looking at what's inside it and is that the way you want to approach it? Otherwise, some people would build their diversified ETF portfolio with individual ETFs like VAS and a couple of others to make up or the ethical portfolio. ETFs. Yeah, yeah, and it's just the I think you have a little bit more flexibility if you're buying the one Australian shares ETF, one international shares ETF, maybe a bit of emerging markets or small companies, and you can adjust the percentages depending on your risk profile, your view of the world, um, what yeah. different providers you want. So it. It really depends firstly on like, do you want just one easy solution and are you happy with what's inside of it? Or do you want to have a bit more control over the weightings? So I think this is like when you order HelloFresh and HelloFresh, if you're a meat eater, HelloFresh comes with a few lamb chops in, in your meal. You've got salad, you've got some potatoes and you've got lamb chops. If you want to put more lamb chops on your plate, go ahead and do that. Just if you order HelloFresh, it's already in the box. So it's up to you if you want more of that. And mm -hmm. so when I look at this, what I think about personally, there are two things. One is I think about the complexity of it. Would it just be easier on me if I had one of them? The second thing is, um, is the allocation right for me? So 
maybe I don't, I don't eat meat, but maybe if I, two lamb chops is not right for me. So I do want to add some more lamb chops on it, but I don't want all the other stuff that comes with it. I don't want extra salad. I just want more lamb chops. So I'm just going to add more VAS to my portfolio. So then if I took the whole thing overall and actually looked what I was investing, if I looked through the VDHG ETF and I saw that, it, oh, VAS is already 35%. So if I had 10,000 of VDHG, I would have in effect indirectly three and a half thousand dollars of VAS already. If I then go and add another two thousand dollars of VAS in my brokerage account, that's five and a half thousand dollars invested in VAS mm. figuratively or like indirectly. So you're overweighting. So you might be overweighting for what you ideally want. So you have to weigh up your allocations. And so it all comes back to that. Do I feel comfortable with this? And is it the right allocation for me? And that's totally up to each individual person to answer. Obviously, if you add mm. more shares, you're going to get more risk than if you add more bonds. That's the that academic approach anyway. Um, yeah, I would say, you know, m- my personal approach is I own the A200 ETF, which is the beta shares A200 ETF. I've owned that for a few years. It's like a super low cost ETF. Um, but I also own VDHG. But that's just what I've done. I don't want to sell VDHG or sell A200 because I'll pay tax. I'm just happy just to keep owning it. But nothing's mm. changed. It's just happy to keep with it. So, I mean, yeah, we, we can't answer your question specifically, Jack, but what I'd just say is that it's, it's about taking that whole mix into account. Um, we've talked in the past about having what we call a core portfolio. So maybe you want to build a core portfolio yourself like Kate does with individual ETFs, or maybe you want to build it with VDHG and then put all the other things around that. Totally up to you. One of the big questions that we got from our ETF members when we held the live session the other night was, why do we go with VDHG over one of the ethical ETFs? That's a really good question too. If you're interested in ethical investing, you probably wouldn't be inclined to own VDHG, just as an, as an aside. So great question, Jack. I wonder if there was some... Uh, and the we, the only on. thing I wanted to add is just, it's a good idea to sort this out earlier on because yeah, it is. The, the tax issues with $1,000 look quite different to... A hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. yeah, and so your your capital gains tax implications are going to be quite different. So sorting this out in your twenties and trying different structures and figuring out what works for you, it's a great time to do it while you're playing with small, fairly small amounts of money. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I never purely will make a decision because of tax reasons. If I want to sell a company, I'm not going to hold on for an extra two months just to. Um, have a reduction in capital gains tax. Like if it's the right time to sell, I'll, I'll sell. But um, yeah, there are implications like if you have been holding for a long period of time. Yeah. And I know there's like quite a few discussions in the FIRE community at the moment where people have built their ETF portfolio over 10 years. It might be quite substantial now. And now they're weighing up what is the capital gains gonna, tax going to look like versus BDHG where I could have a simplified solution. So it gets a lot more complex that discussion and there's a few different more pros and cons to weigh up i'd say in your first five years though don't like that's really important but don't overthink it too much sometimes Mm. it's just better to get comfortable with what you have and sure you know in 10 or 20 years your five thousand dollar investment in whatever etf that you own could be twenty thousand dollars but if you if it's grown that much chances are the rest of your portfolio has grown as well and you've you've managed it along the way and you think okay i've still got it i think the big thing that most etf investors aren't thinking about enough and this is something that we had to think about when we designed the the model portfolios for our etf service was that you've got to be mindful that at the moment fees on etfs are going down generally so some etf providers are dropping fees i think i think all of the big ones have done it vanguard Mm. i know etf securities did it a few others have dropped their fees across the board um but there might be a time when you don't see that happening and so What the fees are today is really important. But as Kate said, if you go forward 10 years, which ETF provider is more likely to have lowered its fees between now and then as well? Because then in 10 years, you're going to be paying less fees on a bigger balance. So -hmm. that's also important too. I don't think enough people think about that. I think the fire community is kind of catching on to that now because they've got bigger balances. They're like, oh, Vanguard's dropped their fees. That's Mm -hmm. really good. But I have this beta shares one, which hasn't dropped its fees. At the time, beta shares were cheaper, but now it looks like this one's cheaper. You know, I'm just using those as examples, yeah. but you get, you get the idea. And as the industry, the ETF industry just grows, like there's so much money just pouring in, the 
companies will be able to start dropping their fees. And so it's really important to kind of stay on top of what the comparable products are to your current ETF and what the fees are and whether it's worth changing based on that. Yeah, and where they're going. Yeah, exactly. Mm. 